everyone, this is Mrs. Marvel. Today I am reading chapter 7 of Peace Like a River, late in the night when the fires are out. Early Wednesday, under red skies, we drove to Montrose for Davy's trial. We've been told to be at the courthouse at 9 a.m., but the colors insisted we breakfast at their house at 7.30. There's no way a person can really prepare for someone like Mrs. DeColor. Buxom and businesslike on her doorstep, once she had you inside, she became the woman you wish had lived next door all the days of your childhood. She was short, round, bright. At the age when most women began putting up their hair, she wore hers long for beauty, and it was beautiful. Black and wooly, her very own buffalo robe. She had turquoise earrings and crisp metallic perfume. Helping Swede off with her coat, she knelt and put her cheek to Swede's and held it there a moment before getting up. Then she said, breakfast is ready, sweet ones, and marched us to the kitchen. It was fitting, that march. There was something about Mrs. DeColor that reminded you of a bass drum. And breakfast? What would you say to butter crumbed eggs that trembled at the touch of your fork? To buttermilk bis biscuits under tumbling steam? To orange sides of salmon laying creamed upon blue saucers? What would you say to fresh peach pie baked not the night before, but that very morning for breakfast? And through everything, Miss DeColor, like a small son beside her proud and outshone husband, beamed down on Sweet and me. It seemed, honestly, like a mistake. I couldn't remember ever being so easily liked. Thus, braced against the evil of the day, we went to the courthouse. We'd thought to visit Davy before it all started, but, there inform but were informed this was impossible and advised to wait on benches in the hall until the jury was seated and giving instructions. What instructions, Swede wanted to know? Listen carefully? In fact, I've learned, trials are mostly a succession of waits. When the benches become restrictive, we, we up and bushwhacked around the big hall. We waited all morning. When others, when others began to arrive, including some newspaper men of our acquaintance, a clerk came and asked if we'd like to wait in separate office, the three of us. We were glad to. A whiskery, yellow-eyed old man was sitting on the neighboring bench. A reporter sat with him, calling him Mr. Finch. The old man didn't answer. His hands shook. He had those thirsty fingers. Stan and Karen Bosca stood in, in uneasy conference by the water fountain. Stan's sister, Marjorie, the famous aunt, had just hove into view down the hall. We followed the clerk to a barren office with a long table a crawl with cigarette burns, and a few minutes later in stepped Mr. DeColor to say it would be a bit longer. The prosecuting attorney, whom I remember only by his first name, Elvis, had detected an attitude problem in one of the jurors. Will it be a long time? Sweet asked, not a hint of wine in the question. She liked Mr. DeColor in th that much. He looked at her, brought out his meerschaum, and squatted comfortably. Lighting the pipe, he said, Tell me, Swede, who in your family is champion in war at sea? Swede blinked, and Mr. DeColor slipped a notebook from his pocket, saying, You've grown up so big not knowing how to play war at sea? I don't believe it. Here. It is thus I most often remember that good lawyer. He, sitting slouched on a folding chair, notebook on his knee, Swede leaning into him as he pointed and strategized, the pants of his brown suit bagging at the ankles. We played war at sea right up through noon, Sweet and I, and then, just when I'd hit on a pattern for locating and destroying her fleet, the door opened and it was Mr. DeColor again and the trial was about to commence. You've seen courtrooms. This one had dark wainscoting all around and a raised jury box fenced by a brass rail, and after we'd all stood up and sat again, it had Judge Raster, whom I'd pictured at some predatory deep-sea critter, sitting behind his high desk. In the flesh, the judge had the kind of wavy white hair I associated with benevolence, the hair of soft-touch ants who keep mints and candy dishes within your reach, Through his, though his eyes, behind half-glasses, evoked no such hopeful impressions. Surprisingly, my first sense of Judge Raster was of a man who clung to small vanities. He had a preening look. You don't like to think it, think it of a judge. Davy was in the front pew beside Mr. DeColor. I was surprised what a short and unrakish figure he had. He play these, You play these things in your mind beforehand, you know, and somehow Davy's entrance into that crowded courtroom, this boy so much interpreted, the silent and notorious Davy Land, was always accompanied in my thoughts by an odd hush and perhaps a thud or two as young women, glimpsing him, fainted away. In real life, nobody seemed to be looking at him. He had on khaki pants, a chambray shirt, 
He needed a shave and looked to have dropped some pounds. I wanted to run forward and make him look in my eyes. After certain formalities, Elvis, the prosecutor, rose to get things started. He cleared his throat and preached an eloquent and transparent sermon on violence, a five-minute redaction in which Davy ceased being any human being's brother and became an icy double murderer who forefigured not only his crimes, but how those crimes would be read, read by a common populace starved for heroics. The confidence with which Elvis nifted my brother, knifed my brother's honor, left my mouth dry. Israel Finch grew into a lost boy of great promise, who, despite his broken home and juvenile record, showed natural talent in the areas of negotiations and auto mechanics, and Tommy Basca, Elvis's ace. Tommy was just some forlorn kitten, out mewing in the dark and the cold and the rain. Through all this, I gaped occasionally at Swede, who appeared snake-bit and vengeful. Then up stood Mr. DeColor to respond. I don't remember his words, but in general feeling, well, remember how the great Daniel Webster argued against the devil for the soul of Jabez Stone? The devil had him beat, you recall, as long as Webster stood on logic. You can't argue with a signed contract, and Jabez, the dolt, had signed. But Webster saw a victory in the devil's face, and in the faces of that hellish jury, the whole lot of them leaning forward, licking their lips, and he calmed himself and began to speak and said about what makes a man a man, and the nature of the soul, and its very creator whence comes all freedom, and so on. And the devil himself did wither in the face of, the bi of this bigger logic, and, so it seemed to me, must Elvis wither, and judge and jury also, when Mr. DeColor had finished his wise and simple statement. They didn't seem impressed, though. In fact, there came some fairly bad moments after that. One came when Elvis called Stanley Bosca to testify. Till now, I thought I had the facts by the tale. Wasn't I an eyewitness? But Stanley had been treasuring up a zinger to impart the court. Davy came around to Finch's place that night. Rotten night out. Nine o'clock or thereabouts, Stanley said. Elvis, did you see him yourself? Stanley? Yes, sir, it was Davy Land. I was over to the Finches looking for Tommy. He was all the time over there. Elvis, they were best friends, your Tommy and Israel Finch. Stanley nodded. Swede later suggested this was because he didn't want to admit it out loud. Elvis, and what did you see Davy do? Stanley, well, he had something in his hand. A tire iron, I guess, or a pry bar. Hard to tell in that rain. Anyway, he whacked every window out of Finch's, Finch boy's car. Elvis, you're saying Davy Land came to the Finch residence with a tire iron, Stanley, or pry bar, it could have been, Elvis, and smashed out the windows of Israel's car in which the boy took inordinate pride. Stanley, well, yes, sir, and the taillights, he got those too. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to make a practice of this transcription business, but as I said, there were salient moments. Those gathered stirred audibly. A surprise revelation. Here was what they'd come for, all right. For me, of course, the surprise quickly deadened into a recognition that it was perfectly true. Swede and I had gone to bed early, so had Dad, on account of his headache. David had gone out into that freezing rain. And later, when I thought him asleep, when the footsteps entered our house, wasn't I amazed when the lights came on and there he was sitting upright, holding his Winchester as if he'd taken it out of bed? Of course he'd taken it to bed. I saw it now. He knew they were coming. He'd issued them an invitation. I looked at Davy's face, couldn't read it, and looked at Dad's, seeing not shock but sorrow and austerity. Evidently, he knew about this. I checked Mr. DeColor. He knew it too. At that moment, a wall inside me shifted. Gravity took hold, and I knew my brother had no chance inside the, that courtroom. Piece by piece, our defensive architecture failed. Marjorie Baska testified, the tears standing in her eyes, how poor Bubby had gone to the store for her twice a week, getting the bread and milk and on occasion a dozen eggs, doing his uncomplaining best. Yellow-eyed, old Mr. Finch, Israel's grandfather, it turned out, told in quiet, convulsive tones how Israel was, was without, without doubt, the most maligned and abominated young man in roofing. He didn't make friends that well, etc., his voice left him after just a few moments. Elvis graciously articulated the old man's powerful, if obscure, emotions, then released them, released him to go wrestle the tormenting ague. Davy's erstwhile girl, Dolly, was sworn in, throwing tragic looks at him, and recounted her experience in the locker room. It clearly troubled her to do so, for she understood 
the, the use Elvis was making of her, establishing for the jury the extant hate between Israel Finch and Davy. Coming to Dad's part in it, though, she may have eased the damage. How is the court of law to take her description of his luminous appearance? Peeking at the jury here, I saw most of them were studying Dad, possibly for radiance, or a look in his eye, or other unnatural credentials. All this time, I was fighting a magnificent swarm of butterflies. Mr. DeCuller had told me I'd have to testify as the single eyewitness of the shooting, shootings. He didn't tell me the prosecution was saving me for last, my story being useful in throwing away the key, but Sweet had figured it out and didn't spare me the knowledge. In craven dread, I sought Sweet's help in rewriting events to Davy's advantage, but Mr. DeCuller reassured me, saying to be honest and forthright, though frugal in detail. Answer only the question, he said. Short declarative sentences. No big prose. Well, he didn't have to worry about that. Who did he think I was, Swede? Anyway, I had a lot of choice, and Mr. DeColor promised to fix my mis- I hadn't a lot of choice, and Mr. DeColor promised to fix my mistakes in his cross-examination. I remember wondering, with the whole day still between me and the stand, whether the whirl in my stomach might be a blossoming case of flu, Surely they would excuse a witness who was busy throwing up. I worked at it a while, remembering something Peter Emerson had told me, that if he thought hard about puking, or better yet remembered instances of his older brother puking, he could just about bring on the real thing himself. I shut my eyes. Once in school, going down to lunch from our third floor classroom, Valentino Vale had leaned over the banister without warning and loosed a cataract of orange vomit, the stairway was the usual open stack, and Valentino's breakfast just dropped forever, three stories down, touching a good number of lives as it rocketed past and hitting the basement tile with the sound zookeepers must hear sometimes around the elephants. I was right behind Valentino and saw it all, an astonishing puke that was discussed for days, yet even this, vividly invoked, could not move my stomach to violence. I envied Peter's mental potency. We're going to lose, Reuben, Sweet told me that night. We were socked into sleeping bags on the floor of Mr. DeColor's study. Though the day had been troublesome and the night was black with the racketous wind, still I found this small library a reassuring place. How could anyone who'd read so many books lose a case in court? Then I remembered Stanley Bosca and the way Elvis had turned righteously toward the jury during his testimony. And I agreed with Sweet, though not aloud. She then said, we've got to break him out. I should have known it was coming. Oh, sweet, don't now. She sat up in her sleeping bag. We could do it. Bust him out of there. Really? Tonight? She had hold of my shoulder. I'm not kidding. I know it. She was up, padding around. They're going to convict him, Reuben. You see it, same as I do. You want Davy in prison? A gust, a gust, gnash at the window. I said, we can't even drive, Swede but it carried no water. She paced in the gloom full of deadly schemes. We'll wait till they're asleep. Take some, take some of Mrs. DeColor's cookies. Off him to the guard. Tell him we've got to see Davy. When he turns to me, you grab his gun, and so on. It was one of those rare moments when I actually felt older than Swede. Seizing it, I told her to grow up. She went silent and fell to studying bookcases. Mr. DeColor had left a reading lamp on in a corner as a nightlight. Had he children of his own, he had known better and so it illuminated the room. I could read the spines from where I lay. C.S. Lewis, Graham Greene, Charles Dickens, lots of Dickens. She returned to bed at last with a book of poems by Robert Louis Stevenson. I said, read me a couple, Swede. Few writers can match Stevenson. Both danger and peace inhabit his verse. It throws a very wide net. So Swede laid beside me, reading Land of Nod, My Ship and I, Northwest Passage, and The Lamplighter, with its wistful narrator. But when I am stronger and can choose what I am to do, oh, Leary, I'll go around at night and light the lamps with you. My heart still breaks with that poem. I love it so. Then Sweet was quiet some little time. I wasn't asleep yet, but I was on the doorstep, a dream just opening up. Listen to this one, Reuben. I opened my eyes. She was propped on an elbow. Sleep already had me in the legs and arms, but Swede looked bright and scared. She read, Whenever the moon and stars are set, whenever the wind is high, all night long in the dark and wet, a man goes riding by. Goose flesh rose. Outside, the wind thumped around. The reading lamp flickered but stayed on. She whispered, Late in the night when the fire goes out, 
Why does he gallop and gallop about? I said, let's sleep, Swede, though I couldn't have, not any more. There was a prescient chill in those lines in her voice. Whenever the trees are crying aloud and ships are tossed at sea, by on the highway, low and loud, by at the gallop goes he, by at the gallop he goes, and then by he comes back at the gallop again. Had I not been eleven, I'd have swirled down, the, down and drawn the sleeping bag over my head. Maybe you're thinking there's nothing creepy about this particular poem. I'm telling you, that night there was. But Swede was watching me for reaction, so I just yawned, a big fake one, and asked was that the end. It's a sign, she said, which of course put a keen point on the vague dread I was feeling. You don't like to say it's a sign at such times, or hear it, or even think of it for fear the words themselves will bear it out. What does it mean? I asked. I don't know. She shut the book and turned out the light and waited a while and then said, I think it means we ought to break him out. Next afternoon, they put me on the stand. I felt like a parakeet up there, new chinos, a green wool sweater that itched at the neck, my hair slicked to a pudding. I looked at dad who smiled back at Dr. Noakes, who winked, at Swede, who was leaning forward, pestering Mr. DeColor in the moments before swearing in. I laid my hand on the Bible, and when finished, looked at Davy, who was straight across the floor. He was making faces, trying to bust me up, just like back in church. Now be warned. I must witness here against myself, and so, as a human brimful of vainglory, may attempt excuse. If so, pay me no mind. The fit will pass." Elvis came up in his bow tie. He asked some chatty questions about school, friends, bullies, stuff I like to do. It irritated me, for I knew what he was up to, getting me comfortable, warming the clay. Also showing the jury how concerned and thorough he was by getting on good terms with Davy's kid brother. Patronizing was the word Swede used later, though by then I was too mortified to ask anyone exactly what it meant. But I was properly terse. I looked him in the eye and answered him straight. And when he came to the end of his getting to know you questions, what he and the court mostly knew was that he hadn't got to me with his smiles and joshing. This was one 11 year old who'd never take sides against his brother. I gave him nothing at first, I promise you. But gradually, ugh, it hurts. Something began to work on me. I began to have, of all things, self-confidence. It crept up like an oily friend. It seemed to me that Elvis began to look less certain of himself, walking to and fro. Clearly, he'd expected I'd be putty by this time, and my own voice sounded particularly grown up, I thought, saying, No, sir, that's not so, or, Sir, he's my brother, and I ought to know. I stirred him to death. I stirred him with a, dis with a disrespect he had to comprehend. And hearing these things from my own mouth, I thought, Not bad. Pride is the rope God allows us all. When Elvis asked if I had scary dreams since the night these things transpired, I replied, Certainly not, sir with what I imagined was the hauteur of a condemned legionnaire. Of course, hauteur is an odd adornment on a boy that age, but oh, the ga that gallery of faces all watching me, faces of friends and erstwhile friends, of interested strangers, of newspaper men. They were my son, my water. I remember hoping, unreasonably, that Bethany Orchard was there watching, and in fact, I did look for her with such concentration that Elvis had to beg my pardon to bring me back. At some point, I looked at Mr. DeColor and saw alarm in his eyes. I actually wondered what was wrong, which tells you how far gone I was. Then Elvis, who'd been working his way forward from the locker room incident, said, Reuben, the night the boys came by and took your sister for a ride. A ride? How do you like that? What happened that night, before the sheriff arrived? Do you remember? As if I might have forgotten, as if the chill of Israel Finch's intrusion wouldn't be forever as close as air to skin, memory chasing pretense for a moment, I said, well, Swede was white, and she looked real small. Small? Yes, sir. Usually she's as big as me. In retrospect, in retrospect, it was as telling a statement as I ever made. It also produced an audible ripple of goodwill for this youngster on the stand. Immediately, I felt reduced from budding hero to guileless moppet. Elvis turned to the gallery and made the most of it, and I'm ashamed to say how his doing so tweaked my attitude. Having lost ground here, I ought have simply dug in, humbled, and held my new position, but I become a proud twerp over the preceding 15 minutes. Turning back to me, Elvis smiled. Reuben, was Davy angry that night? He thought I was hesitating out of fear to answer the question. I convinced, 
I confess to you now I was only looking for the right voice, something legionnaire-ish. Oh, I still wanted to do my best by Davy. I hadn't forgotten him, but I wanted to sound smooth doing it, you see, like a hot shot, Mighty Stinson would have said. Albus prompted, something like that happening to his little sister. Say, I would have been upset, a thing like that. Reaching down for a good low register, I replied, no, sir, Davy was, e was as easygoing as anything. And truly, that's how he'd been, not pale and dry with fear like sweet in me, but calm with a stillness that was itself fearsome. Except on easy going, my voice slipped back into its normal range, or possibly a little higher. I discerned snickering. Again, I was ridiculous before my public. Then Elvis said gently, Now, Reuben, haven't you told us how your brother sticks up for you, protects you? I had. And now you're telling us he didn't have a thing to say after Tommy and Israel brought her home, scared as she was by those boys and Davy just sitting quiet? Posed like that, it did seem unlikely. I thought it over, sensing the court waiting. Davy had said something, hadn't he? Just before Ted Pullet drove in. I looked at my brother there in the courtroom and tried to recall. And do you know, when Davy looked back, something was different. Something in the look itself, it was untethered somehow, loosed from Elvis and the jury and judge. He smiled at me from some planetary distance, and I thought of, I thought of his way in the kitchen that night, how he'd hooked the car keys on his finger and yielded them to Dad, wordlessly, after a long and inner weighing, and I remembered. Why, yes, sir, I told Elvis. He asked Dad a question. He said, how many times do you let a dog bite you before you put him down? And the court did not erupt, nor the jury gasped in wonder at this revelation. Only Elvis's eyebrows rose slightly, and, and Reuben, he said, with such gentle approval my blood gelled to a stop, you have been holding out on us. That night, I agreed to break Jav Davy out of jail. Swede knew I would. She had on her side the fact that I had as much as damned our brother to prison, and therefore death, for he would die there, or some core inside him would. We lay awake while the adults spoke in council long and low in the kitchen, and Swede laid our plans. Desperate, slapdash, bloody plans. I was in no position to propose alternatives. I never saw her so upset or brilliant. She was like a horse let out to run. I did make one suggestion about guns being better than knives for the work at hand. She shook her head in regret. They don't have any guns. I looked everywhere. Poor Mr. DeColor, she added. Someday I'm going to buy him one. Yes. Poor Mr. DeColor. After my damaging performance, I'd been unable to avoid his eyes, and the sorrow and disappointment they showed were as if I'd struck him in public. I tried to apologize and broke down before him, and his forgiveness was so quiet and complete I could only grieve the more. And why, you're wondering, did I toss Elvis that line of Davies about putting down the dog? Well, I suppose I had to, once I'd gone and remembered it. Elvis had asked me the question, and I was tied to honesty by oath. A person can't register honesty any more than any other avoidables, unavoidables. A plain face or a poor history. What I regret is how I said it, like your choice of stupid punks with something to prove. I said it with belligerence, a trait ever cultivated by fools. I said it, I tremble to admit, as Israel Finch might have, and predictably chaos accompanied belligerence into office, for that putting down the dog remark led Elvis to seek and pull from me other facts pointing to ill intent, that Davy already had his coat on to deliver vengeance when Dad stopped him, that Davy had been angry with Dad earlier when it seemed to him the locker room beating hadn't been nearly severe enough, that Davy, waiting on the stairs for his arrest after the shootings, had grabbed my wrist and spoken the words, I meant to. With despair, I heard myself answer Elvis's inquiries, each answer seeming horribly convicting to the, the moment it was uttered. Oh, I was meek enough fellow now, but it didn't matter. Elvis drew these facts from me and unfolded them to view and laid them before the court like a series of bloody hankies. I saw it happening but could not stop it. Humility came to me too late. I'm a living proverb. Learn from me. We went to bed jittery, faking weariness. Even as Dad prayed over us for forgiveness and joy and a night of peace, Swede in her sleeping bag was clutching a box of steak knives stolen from the DeColor's kitchen. We shut our eyes, slurred our good nights. The moment Dad left the room, Swede bounded up and pulled jeans over her pajamas. She strapped on a belt and stuck two knives in it, right and left. Gravely, she offered me the box. I chose two and with grim aspect slid them in my belt. Swede crossed her arms. 
She might have sailed with Francis Drake. She said, we are of noble tradition, Reuben. I buttoned up a flannel shirt and drew blood from the three knuckles tucking it in. We'd have sneaked out then, except the adults decided to have their evening coffee in the living room. This was inconsistent and very probably the work of the Lord. The front door was in the living room and we weren't likely to just waltz out through it. Trapped and mutinous, we worked our brains. We'll go out the window, said Swede, but Mr. DeColor, in his efficiency, had put his storms up right on schedule. We sat down in misery, mine counterfeit, I will admit. I guess we'll have to wait, I said. It was fine. Outside the trees were leaning their tops around in the wind. The pane was so cold it felt wet. But Swede was intent. After they're asleep then. Which, of course, was not what I meant by wait. I meant the rhetorical wait, as in wait till next year, or just you wait and see. Oh, I'm sure they'll be up a long time, I said, thinking, oh, Lord, let them stay up. And don't you know, they did. After a while, we lay down on top of our sleeping bags, just to soften the weight, and the wind tumbled stuff around outside, and a fine freezing rain began against the window, and I began to dream that a small piglet sat beside me, brown and aloof, and bit me on the hip when I rolled over. Actually, it was one of the steak knives. I sat up to feel her blood. The house was asleep, Swede too. She groused a little in a dream as I slipped the knives from her belt, but she didn't wake. Next thing I recall is Dad kneeling between my bag and Swede's, waking us up before sunup, strangely. I remember Mrs. DeColor singing in her kitchen and the excited music of pans and perking coffee, and there was an agitation in Dad's voice that made me think, just for a moment, that we were on our way west, the car packed and pointed toward the faint cries of geese, the thrill of the cold. Then I heard Dad say, his voice part of sleep, his voice coming off balance into my sleep like a man feeling into a dark room. The sheriff was here an hour ago. Wake up, kids. The sheriff has been here. Kids, are you listening? Davies broke out. 